please be seated. Please pray with me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. <clears throat> the New Testament reading for today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Hear the word of God. <clears throat> in those days, Mary set out and went with haste to, the, to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts, in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mary's reply to Elizabeth is perhaps the first Christmas carol. Singing of the joy and the meaning and the impact of Jesus' birth. Now, we've all noticed there weren't any reindeer or snowmen or chestnuts roasting on, an empty, on a roasting fire and a sleigh ride. But instead, she dials down to what it's really about. Because it's a hymn of praise on the lips of Mary about the birth of Jesus. Over the years, it's been called the Magnificat because it is so magnificent, the picture that it paints. But is it something that is to be? Or is it just idle thinking? Because this is a song of praise to God, praise of God for his goodness, his protection, and his faithfulness. But you know what? I don't know a preacher or a prophet that would love to have those words with that power and meaning to be on their lips. And yet, God gave it to this peasant woman who came from this little podunk town. And God used this simple lady to proclaim this everlasting and eternal truth. Because Mary's life probably seemed pretty ordinary until this angel showed up, until Gabriel messed everything up. Now, evidently, she had a great, a fantastic reputation. But what were the expectations for her? You know, well, Mary probably thought about having children, I highly doubt that she would have ever thought that she would give birth to the Messiah. And it's a pretty safe bet that she would have planned to have had children after she was married rather than before. And yet, God shows up, and all her plans go out the window. This ordinary life of an ordinary woman with ordinary hopes, thoughts, and dreams, God speaks. And then everything for her was eternally different. The angel's words to Mary turned her world upside down. And if it wasn't for the intervention of Gabriel, her husband would have left her, albeit kindly. The pregnancy, 
even though Gabriel spoke to her, might not have been so easy to explain to her neighbors and her other family members. There were probably whispers behind her back. Because how many of those people go, oh, an angel came to you, Mary? Yeah, right. It's a safe bet. She paid a price that she might have been ostracized and degraded, abandoned by people she once thought were friends, and in fact, might have faced the possibility of being stoned to death. Because God had a plan for her. And that plan was not on the path she thought she had for her life. But in this piece, in this Magnificat, her response to the proclamation of Elizabeth, she proclaims great joy. Not just for herself, that her soul magnifies the Lord, but joy for the world, as we sang. She responds, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And her life was off on a totally different path than it ever was before. Early in her pregnancy, she leaves where she's been living and heads up to the Judean hill country. It's kind of south, down near Jerusalem. And visits Elizabeth, her relative. And something amazing happens as Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, as Mary is coming to her house. This baby in Elizabeth leaps for joy. <laughs> it's, it's a miraculous thing. Don't ask me to explain it other than it being a sign that this baby who is to be John the Baptist is able to recognize the Messiah inside Mary. But both of these women are miraculously pregnant in ways that are unexplainable and unexpected for both of them. Now for Elizabeth, an angel, Gabriel again, appears to her husband, Zechariah, and says, you're going to be a daddy. <laughs> Zechariah goes, well, how? Mm, I thought those days were over. I'm, I'm an old man, and my wife has a few years on her too. And because he doubted, he wasn't able to speak until that baby was born. Mary, she had her questions. How can this be that I'm going to have a baby? I'm still a virgin. But these are not obstacles to God, are they? That God calls people to unexpected paths, not because they can do it, but because God can do it. Both women know that these, these pregnancies are a work of God when they come together, these dual miracles, throw a party. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth proclaims to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And that's the introduction to what is going to be upon Mary's lips that continue to echo to us today. That this thing that has happened with her, in her, through her, despite her, the thing that she might have dreaded is the thing that celebrates. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, for now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mary expresses a lot about herself, but it's not all about her. 
Mary sees that what God is doing involves her, but it's far bigger than her. She sees what's happening as part of God's work throughout in, in all the world. God has purposes for her, but he also has purposes for the world. And God's purpose is to use her to bear this child for the sake of the world. God has done great things in her, she claims. But she also speaks about all generations understanding and experiencing that blessing. That God's not just sitting still. God's not ignoring all these things that are wrong. But we find that God fulfills his promises. And these are two very unexpected ways between Elizabeth and between Mary. Mary proclaims that, you know, this way that God is working out his plans and in his purposes, this disruption of her life is going to be a blessing that will extend from generation to generation. And it's not just about her, it's not just about this baby, but about the impact of that in the world and indeed in, uh, for all eternity. He says, you know what? God's going to feed the hungry, but he's also going to give the rich who abuse that a taste of their own medicine. Mary celebrates, rejoices what God is doing right then and there, as well as what God is yet to do. And truthfully, our Christmas celebration shouldn't be separated from these things that Mary is celebrating. As she exclaims, all generations will call me blessed. We're quite a few generations away from her. We celebrate the birth of that child and celebrate our own blessings as well. Now, as we've been on this Advent journey, we've uh, remembered that the Messiah was promised in the midst of turmoil, difficulty, and pain. And so it is that Jesus' birth is more than just saving us, forgiving our sins and our salvation. It is all those things. But it's also part of God's plan for the world. And it's not for us as spectators. It's for us as participants. Mary named, God named Mary and called Mary. A woman who had a lot of excuses about why it shouldn't be her. To do this thing that forever changes the world. We live in a world where the strong and the powerful manage to stay on top. <laughs> but Mary's song is very clear that what is happening in this child is going to disrupt all of that. The powerful are brought low, the humble and the poor are lifted up. You know, as American Christians, um, myself included, often think a lot about how Jesus disrupts our own sinful hearts, disrupts the cost of our sin, brings our salvation, works in us, shapes us into the image of Christ. But there's something far more, and if that's all that we talk about, we miss so much of the purpose of Jesus in the world and in God's plan because Jesus is given in the midst of anxiety, of need, of injustice, of oppression. And we still see those things in our lives here today, don't we? In us, around the world. And just as God called this young woman to make an eternal difference, God calls each of us in a unique way to be part of that work as well. Not because we can do it, because let's face it, uh, Elizabeth, probably her body probably wasn't in that game anymore. And Mary was missing a whole step of that process. But that wasn't an obstacle for God. Mary's song about her child 
is about God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. From Mary's song, God's mercy is from everlasting to those who are in awe of him. But he scatters those who are vain and are proud. He brings down the powerful from, the, from their thrones, and he lifts up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You know, whether it's the uh, prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures or throughout the New Testament, the birth of Jesus is always told as messing up the way things always had been in order that they can be the way God created them to be. You know, we talk a lot about nostalgia, about the way things once were, and we long for the ways they once were, and you know what? There's a lot of that to celebrate because they give us some foundations and some guide rails. But those foundations are to be built on, and their guide rails are to take us forward because the real meaning of those things that we celebrate in the past is what they mean to us today and where they lead us in the future. If nostalgia is longing for the past, I'm just going to tell it to you. The birth of Jesus disrupts that. (laughs) Because the dirt birth of Jesus is to point us to the future. What can be, what will be. Because it's prophesied in the terms of what is yet to come. Of anticipation. Rather than nostalgia. Looking forward rather than looking back. That in God, it's to be found in God's faithfulness rather than our own expectations. And you better believe that you got a part in this. We're not spectators. The gift of Christmas is to enter into God's plan, into His purposes. And that's what Mary sees as her great blessing, that God will do great things through an ordinary woman like her. That in the birth of Jesus, God will reveal His mercy and His power. (laughs) And if 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 Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we shouldn't be surprised at all that God takes us from our plans and moves us into His plan. In that we will receive the greatest gift as we enter into that purpose. And you know what? Like Mary, (laughs) what God calls you to do, what God calls me to do will be a little different. But it'll probably disrupt your plans and your expectations. And it isn't because we want too much. It's probably because we settle for so little. Because discovering our purpose in serving is God's plan rather than being served and giving rather than accumulating and humility rather than power. The angel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus and he will be called the Son of the Most High. She had questions. How could that possibly be? And Gabriel told her, as God continues to tell each of us, It's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do. And faced with the choice of that step, Mary had a powerful reply. And may it be mine and yours too. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. What will we say when God calls our name? Amen.